Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3 say, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, we're starting, we're doing Romans chapter 10 here in our Roman series, and the first thing we see here is something very important. In verse 1, we get to see a look into Paul's headspace, into Paul's thought process. Paul is grieved that a lot of his fellow Israelites are not going to accept Christ and be saved. He's grieved at the fact that a lot of his fellow Israelites are going to wind up going to hell because instead of trusting Christ's perfect righteousness, they want to trust their own righteousness, which is of filthy rags. So that explains some of the decisions that Paul made that might have seemed a bit inappropriate, and some of them were, like getting Timothy circumcised when that really wasn't necessary, or going back to Jerusalem even though the Holy Spirit told him not to and warned him multiple times in the book of Acts. We see Paul taking these actions because he's driven by a passion that is overriding his reason, is overriding him being in obedience to God. But we see why that is, why he did those things here in verse 1. But notice in verse 2, it says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So just because someone is zealous doesn't mean they're right. Just because someone jumps up and down and screams about something, just because they pound the pulpit, just because they sing their words and put high at the end, all that stuff, just because someone has passion in what they say does not mean they're right. You have to look at the substance of what they're saying. Because the Bible says that the spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets. Meaning, if you're preaching something and I hear what you're saying, I need to go back to my Bible and evaluate and determine is what you're saying actually true. Do like the Bereans did, where they searched the scripture daily whether those things were so. Now, here's the thing. Look in verse, in verse 1, we see how passionate Paul is to get the Israelites saved. But then in verse 3, he goes and tells them, how wrong they are, right? That they're ignorant of God's righteousness, that they're trying to establish their own righteousness and not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. When you really are passionate about seeing someone saved, you're not afraid to tell them they're wrong. You're not afraid to tell them that their righteousness is not enough. You're not afraid to tell them that they have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But all too often, so many so-called churches are out of the business of telling someone they're wrong. They're out of the business of telling someone that they need to get saved. They're out of the business of telling people they don't know God and all they want to do is basically just have a pizza party with everybody and put their arms around everyone and be liked about by everyone. Listen, if, if person A who's saved knows that person B is not saved and person A is afraid to tell person B that they're wrong, person A acts like person B is saved, person A is going to affirm every decision person B makes, then guess what? Person A doesn't really love person B. Doesn't really want to make sure person B gets saved. If you're afraid to tell someone that they're wrong about salvation, you need to look inside your heart and ask, do you really care if that person goes to hell or not? Do you really care if that person lives or dies? Spiritually speaking, of course. Because if you don't care, then you're going to just ignore them and just pretend that they're right. Paul was not about to do that. Paul did not pretend that the Jews were right for rejecting God. He acknowledged that they were wrong for rejecting Christ. Verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He is the end of the law. Why? Because he fulfilled it. He did what we could not. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was the perfect sacrifice without spot or blemish. Jesus Christ kept the law you and I could not. He did what we could not. He paid the price we could not pay. And that's why he's the end of the law. Because once I become a Christian... I am no longer trusting my works to save me. I am no longer, tr before you're saved, of course, you're more than likely trusting your own works to save you. But when you put your faith on Christ, that's the end of it. Why? Because Christ has already paid the price for you and you are no longer trusting the law to save you. Verse 5, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now when it says shall live by them, right there, that is actually a quote from Leviticus, I think it's chapter 18. And in that chapter, we see a long list of laws that Moses gave the Israelites, you know, that God gave Moses. These laws were designed to hold a nation together. These laws were designed to be the bedrock of a, of a functioning society. And these laws 
carried with them the death penalty if you violated them. So when it says shall live by them, that's talking about their physical life being preserved. And the message there, if you know where Leviticus 18 is, is that keeping God's commandments is what holds society together. Keeping God's commandments is what protects your physical life. But that has nothing to do with the salvation of your soul. Because if you go back to Leviticus chapter 18, that's not a salvation chapter whatsoever. It's talking about how to hold a society together. When people are obeying God's commandments, that's enough to bless a society and help it work correctly physically. But here's the sad part. Just because you keep God's commandments, or at least keep the ones you know about, does not mean that you're saved. There will be people who are burning in hell right now who never cheated on their wives. People who are burning in hell right now who never had a single cigarette, who never had a single sip of alcohol, who never had sex outside of marriage, but they're burning in hell. Why? Let's go to the next verse. But the righteousness which is of faith. So the righteousness that saves the soul is of your faith. It has nothing to do with you keeping the law. It says, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Now, why would someone say, who shall ascend into heaven? You have people who refuse to trust Christ until they see him, until they lay eyes on him. They'll say, why would I believe this old book? Why would I believe these things I've never seen? Why would I believe these things that I've never laid my eyes on? In fact, there was even a time where that kind of doubt crept into even a saved person's mind. Remember doubting Thomas? How after Jesus was resurrected, Thomas was basically saying, oh, the resurrection hasn't happened, right? He was saying, oh, oh, it's not Jesus. You didn't see Jesus. He didn't want to see G He didn't want to believe that he saw G that they saw Jesus until he could touch the nail prints in Jesus' hand and thrust his hand in his side. But what did Jesus say when he finally appeared to Thomas? He said to him, be not faithless, but believing. And then he go and then he goes on to say, you believe because you've seen me, but blessed are those who believe even though they haven't seen. That's you and I as Christians. We believe on Christ even though we haven't seen him. God says we're blessed for it. So God wants us as Christians to walk by faith and not by sight. Even though we haven't seen him, laid eyes on him, we haven't touched him, we know that his word is true and we know in the we know the power of his word. And as a little aside, there are people who claim to have gotten a vision from Christ. That's not scriptural. Anyone who calls them, any church where the pastor refers to himself as apostle so-and-so, run. Because I guarantee you they're wrong on salvation and they're about to say some stuff that's just left field and has nothing to do with the gospel. Verse 7. Or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? So we don't need to be one of these people who, oh, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. Because guess what? You had people that saw Christ do miracles, and they said he's doing it by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. You have people who knew that Christ resurrected, and instead of believing, they wanted to pay off the guards to lie and say someone stole his body. There are people where they have a preconceived notion that Christ is not the Lord, and they will look for any reason to justify that decision. That's why the whole thing of, oh, well, show me physical proof, that is not a valid counter argument against the Bible because even if you show them proof they're gonna look for some other reason not to believe I guarantee you if Christ were to come back today there would be a whole bunch of atheists who instead of saying oh it's the Lord I was wrong Jesus saved me they would probably say something like oh it's an alien quick get the telescope get out the Morse code try to communicate with it there are people who if Jesus were to come back they would probably try to explain it away rather than actually believe in fact, when Jesus comes back to rapture up his believers before he pulls out his, pours out his wrath on humanity, those people that he pours out his wrath on still refuse to believe, even though he had already come back at that point. So even in the book of Revelation, after Jesus will eventually return for his believers, there are still people left behind who, even with that great sign in the sky of him coming, are still not going to believe. So that whole argument of, oh, well, show me physical evidence. That's not a valid counter-argument against Scripture. Verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. And in, in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now what does that look like, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus? The thief on the cross is a perfect example of that. He looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now, 
He said, Lord, so he's acknowledging the deity of Christ. He said, remember me, so he's acknowledging that Jesus Christ had the right to judge him. And then he said, when thou comest into thy kingdom. Not if thou comest into thy kingdom, when thou comest into thy kingdom. So the thief on the cross was acknowledging that Jesus would come back and rule. Therefore, he was acknowledging the resurrection. So it says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Not the prophet Jesus. Not the nice guy Jesus. Not the angel Jesus like the Mormons believe. Not the magician Jesus like what the Jews believe, but the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is by faith because it says believe in thine heart. So confess with thy mouth, that's simply just asking him to save you. Believe in thine heart, that's just, that's your faith. It says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You have people out there who even if you walk them through the sinner's prayer and say it, if they don't actually believe what they're saying, if they don't actually believe on Christ, just because you made them repeat after you does not mean that they're necessarily saved. Because just because you have someone say the sinner's prayer doesn't mean they're saved. If they don't believe it, you're just literally just basically having them go through the motions. So you can't look at, oh, they said a prayer, that means they're saved. But it says, with the heart man believed unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So I can know that you're saved by listening to your confession. If I walk up to you and I say, what does it take to get into heaven? And you say anything other than the work of Christ on the cross, you say anything other than Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, you say anything other than faith, I know that you're not making a confession of salvation. You're not saved. I can judge the fruit of your lips. I can judge your doctrine. Now, there's when it comes to whether or not someone should say the sinner's prayer, I recently ran into someone who actually discourages soul winners from saying the sinner's prayer because, oh, you can't tell if the person actually believes that. You're just using them like a puppet. It's a work. I've heard all these kinds of arguments. Here's the thing, and I'm just going to be perfectly clear on this. If you read the book of Nehemiah, we see Nehemiah praying to the Lord while he's doing his job, while he's talking to the king, while he's going about his business. Nehemiah was praying from his heart. And according to the Bible, it says in verse 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So if inside someone's heart, they say to God, Lord, I believe. If within their heart, they say, Lord, please save me. If within their heart, they say that they want to go to heaven, they, they want the gift of salvation from Christ, the Bible says, asking shall be given unto you. And God answers prayers that are from your heart. God, God answers prayers that are from your head. So the idea that, oh, it needs to be a verbal prayer. If someone prays from their heart, when we saw that God answered Nehemiah's prayer, and the Bible says God tries the hearts and the reins. The Bible says in Jesus knowing their thoughts. So I believe that if you had somebody who for whatever reason they prayed it in their heart, I believe that person's saved. Now, what if you have a mute person, for example, who can't talk? If they pray it from their heart, that person's saved because it says with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So if you over here believe and you said the sinner's prayer out loud, you over here believe and you ask God for salvation from your heart, I believe both those people would be going to heaven. Anyway, it says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Whosoever believeth on him. It's about your faith. It's not about your works. So you see, we start at Romans 10. Paul was talking about how good works hold a society together. Right? That's in verse 3. Uh, verses 3 and 4. But after that, we see that it's faith that saves you, not your works. Verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God does not, notice there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. God doesn't give the Jew a VIP pass. Oh, you don't actually have to believe. You just need to keep your rituals, keep your sideburns curly, keep that cube on your forehead, and you're saved. No. Everyone needs to trust on Christ. Everyone needs to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, needs to put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. God doesn't give anyone a pass because of their nationality. God requires everybody to come through that same door, and Jesus said, I am the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's you, believer. You're the preacher. When it says preacher there, it's not talking about the guy with his collar backwards. It's not talking about the guy with the pointy hat. 
It's not talking about the guy with the really shiny robes. It's not talking about the guy with the blazer that goes down to his knees. It's talking about you as a believer. You are the preacher. Verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Notice what it says there about the people that are preaching. It says they have the gospel of peace, right? Because we as believers, we have peace with God. His wrath is no longer abiding on us because we're a believer. And bring glad tidings of good things. It doesn't say how beautiful are the feet of them that went to seminary. It doesn't say how beautiful are the feet of them that went to Bible college. It doesn't say how beautiful are the feet of them that have been pastorally ordained. It says the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. If you have the right gospel, that is literally all that is required for you to get someone else saved. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah say, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So what is this saying? Even back, Isaiah is the Greek way of saying Isaiah. So even back in Isaiah's day, Isaiah experienced the same frustration Paul is of not everyone of his nation is believing on the right gospel. That's why Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Isaiah looks up at God and says, Lord, nobody's listening to me. Imagine the frustration. I mean, think about this. How do you have a nation that heard the preaching of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, these heavy hitters, and yet this nation still eventually becomes the nation that rejects Christ and nails him to the cross. That means that there were people who, even though these great prophets were preaching, they didn't listen and they didn't teach their kids. But verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Christianity is spread at the tip of the ear, not the tip of the spear. There are a lot of people who will make this argument, and as a Christian, I cringe whenever I hear this. They'll say that Ferdinand and Isabella, or they'll say whatever, you know, whatever works salvation, whatever Protestant or Catholic monarch, they spread Christianity, quote, at the tip of the spear. That is a bold-faced lie. You cannot be forcefully compelled into believing on Jesus. That is not, God does not force his way into your mind. God does not force his way into your spirit. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. Faith doesn't come... Faith cometh not by being stabbed or being shot at or being forced to believe. No, it comes by hearing. So if somebody under duress made a confession, that's not a real confession of faith. It comes by people preaching with the sword of the Spirit. That's not to say that Christians should be defenseless, but anytime someone tries to tell you they spread Christianity by the tip of the spear, false. Take them to Romans 10, 17 and show them that it comes by the word of God not through any of these things that colonizers used. Verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. That's a quote from, I believe, Psalm 19. And what that is basically saying is even back then, God's responsibility was that believers would spread his word throughout the end of the world. But, did, but I say, did not Israel know? For Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. We are that foolish nation, you and I. You know why? Because most of us hearing this sermon, we don't descend from the people who had the word of God at their fingertips. We don't descend from people who had the Mosaic law baked into their culture. Most of us descend, if we were to go back to our ancestors, we probably descend from people who did not initially have the word of God as part of their culture. I know I don't. I'm largely of Native American ancestry. My ancestors did not receive the covenants from, Mos uh, from Moses. Or my ancestors were not at Mount Sinai. And you know, the rest of my ancestry, they weren't there. So all of that to say, but you know what? I have the word of God. And so I right now, as an indigenous American Christian, I'm a believer, I have a Bible, I have access to God's spirit, because I have faith in Christ. I have access to his word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. I have a closer relationship with God than that pure Jewish rabbi sitting in the synagogue right now. I know God better than he does. He has a reason to feel jealous of me. He has a reason to feel angry at me because he spent his whole life learning, memorizing all of these uh, you know, verses in the Talmud. He spent his whole life with all this scholarship and he's no closer to God than 
a watermelon is. He's no closer to God than that wall is. He's no closer to God than a flea is. But you and I as Christians, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. Can you understand why it is that that would anger someone? Why it is that there would be people in the synagogue who don't want to see Christianity spread, who want to put Christianity down? Because they are jealous of our relationship with God. And so that's why we need to understand we should not be looking at them as our spiritual big brother. We should be looking at them as a lost person that we should lovingly preach the gospel to. And if they reject it, shake the dust off of our feet, let them be anathema maranatha and just go on serving God and preaching to who will be saved. But don't get me wrong, I'm not preaching that we should automatically, you know, hate the Jew when we run into him. No, not at all. Do you know how many Jews got saved? Do you know that the early church was packed with former Jews who put their faith on Christ? But what we need to do is preach him the gospel. And if he doesn't want to hear it, we back off. That's between them and God at that point. But as verse 20, but Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. He's talking about people who did not. Notice, I was found of them that sought me not. These are people who are not trying to establish their own righteousness. These are people that were reached out to. Think about it. If you, you didn't seek him, but you were found of him, but he was found of you, that means that somebody came and gave you the gospel. And so he's Isaiah, that's what Isaiah says. Isaiah is preaching that that even happened in the Old Testament, that God, that God sent his preachers out to reach people. But notice in verse 21, But to Israel he saith, All day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So here we have God frustrated with the Israelites for rejecting him, but these people over here were willing to listen. Here's the thing. Your friend, who you've been hanging out with that whole time, who you know really well, if he doesn't want to hear the gospel, move on. This person you were trying to get saved, if they don't want to hear it, move on. Because for every gainsaying person out there that doesn't want to hear it, there's someone that sought him not. There's someone who didn't know the way, and you showed them the way. So don't let your pile of rejections of people who don't want to hear the gospel frustrate you because there's going to be someone over there who will gladly hear it. Paul's ministry to the Jews didn't go so well. But you know what? God used him mightily for the Gentiles, and we should bear that in mind. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that, you know, Romans 9, 10, and 11, Calvinists like, you know, let me explain what Calvinism is because I always mention this at the end of these two chapters. Calvinism is basically nihilism disguised as Christianity. There's no free will. God just picked and chose every, everyone's decisions before, you know, the beginning of time, and you're kind of stuck. It's like an on-rails game, right? Well, if that's the case, then you shouldn't see a frustrated God, right? Because in verse 21, he says they disobeyed him. How can you disobey if there's no free will? And that's why we need to understand free will does exist, and that is why we need to understand don't get frustrated when someone rejects your gospel message. Just go to the person that will listen. Because for every disobedient and gainsaying person, look for the person who actually can be saved. God bless you.